Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the dissertation defense of Tim O'Connor. Um, my name is Darren Lapomi from the PhD supervisor. Uh, Tim started his uh, scientific career at Bowling Green State University, where he earned his BS and MS degree. Uh, and he had a really prolific uh, undergraduate and master's degree program with seven papers and Doctor papers, including uh, a book chapter. Um, he came to UCSD in 2012, actually the same time that I showed up in this department, at the same time that the building opened. So he's really been a fixture of, uh, of SME and nanoengineering uh, for the last five years. Um, since Tim, so Tim joined my group as the second graduate student um, after Adam Prince, who's joining us uh, via the interwebs. Um, and, uh, and had a number of uh, productive relationships with, uh, with the students um, who joined in this cohort, including uh, Alex and Suchel, who are also here, a uh, part of the, uh, the Fab Four, uh, as I maybe called them once. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so the research kind of rests on three, uh, three, three pillars. There's science and engineering that, that we're all aware of, but there's also an equal part uh, of invention. Now invention is a really critical part of the research enterprise and it's it's taking conjuring something into existence that didn't exist before. In this case based on the more uh, fundamental structure property relationships that my group has been working on to, uh, to uh, make printed electronic materials more mechanically compliant and, and lifelike. So Tim will tell you about several of his, uh, of his inventions um, uh, that have been done in synergy with the more fundamental uh, uh, work going on in the group at the same time. Um, Tim has been, so as I mentioned, a, a fixture in SME and nanoengineering. He's the founding uh, president of the Graduate Society for Nanoengineers, which is a really important um, service role that he took on in his second or third year. Um, second and third years, and uh, has also won a number of recognitions, such as the uh, National Defense Science and Engineering Graduate Fellowship, or the NDSEG. In 2015, he won the, uh, the uh, top poster prize in the Center for Wearable Sensors pitch competition, and then a few months later, at the Jacobs School of Research Expo, actually won the top poster presentation out of uh, more than 100, or more than 200 uh, entries. Uh, one thing that's really nice about the, uh, the, the uh, in inventive character of Tim's work is that it tends to get some, uh, some popular press coverage as well. So some of you who are, uh, who are driving to work and listen to NPR about 10 days ago might have heard Tim being interviewed. Last Monday, actually, he was interviewed um, in, uh, in person. So uh, it's not often that I get to characterize a scientific talk as uh, as exciting, but I'm but I'm sure this one will be. So <laughs> all right, thank you all for coming today. Good afternoon. Thank you to my committee and thank you, Darren, for that stellar introduction. Um, uh, uh, my my time uh, of building our lab you know, over the past five years has meant, meant the world to me, and um, it's been an honor to push our. Uh, applied Frontier. I promise to use my skills in the future to impact the world as much as I can. Uh, for those who aren't uh, familiar previously with our work, uh, the Lapomi Lab is a vertically integrated research group uh, that deals with the design, synthesis, characterization, and prototyping of molecularly stretchable electronic materials. And by that, I mean um, uh, mo uh, electronic materials that have uh, uh, materials that have electronic properties like metals or semiconductors, like silicon except they have mechanical properties like tissue or skin. And my job, as he mentioned in the lab, was to build, um, new, uh, to build new prototypes and new applications with the materials that we had characterized. So when I came to U UCSD for a PhD, um, my grad motivations were solar energy, and, uh, uh, for uh, research in solar energy, and uh, to help bridge the gap between uh, humans and our technology. And uh, uh, solar energy is my main passion. It's my strong belief that many of the world's, most of the world's suffering could be alleviated with uh, access to clean, uh, clean energy. Um, and this thought has, has keep, kept me motivated and driven me throughout my research over the years. So um, 
Uh, so these projects, uh, the overview, the, or this talk is going to be given almost in chronological order. It'll be uh, the story of the projects as they went forward. And uh, it started with solar energy, and as uh, each project would seed the growth of the next one. And as each project developed, they even became more human-like in function and form. So it'll start with work that I did with stre uh, stretchable organic solar cells, or OPVs, or organic photovoltaics, where we transfer printed uh, a solar cell onto the surface of a glass hemisphere. And we did this project to show the importance of choosing the proper materials when making a stretchable solar cell. Uh, then I did my first project on wearable electronics. So this is a um, wearable OPV in the form of a, a patch that was put on the wrist on the human body. And this was an application of wearable electronics powering other wearable electronics. Then we went from the wrist to the hand, um, and I made a, an integrated device that allowed for the uh, gesture recognition and the uh, um, translation of American Sign Language into text wirelessly. Uh, and this used, rather than uh, the first two projects, used these uh, plastic electronic materials, conjugated polymers. And this actually switches material type. This is a composite material, a nano composite material. Um, and I pushed this, uh, this idea as far as it could go with my time left here. And the final project still uses a glove, but a fully integrated system for the haptic control of robots and the transmission of touch emulation for remote sensing and virtual environments. So even though these, uh, these two sets of projects use different material types, the one thing that enables both of them is mechanically compliant electronic materials. And by mechanically compliant, um, I mean flexible and stretchable electronic uh, electronics. And that's what uh, enables these devices uh, to conform to something uh, as dynamic and unpredictable as the human body and maintain uninterrupted function. So let's start with solar. Um, more energy in the form of sunlight strikes the Earth in one hour than all human activity uses in a year. Uh, the sun has been the driving force of all processes on this planet, and it's, it's certainly our best energy source that we have. It's more energy than we would ever need, so we just need an effective way to harvest that energy. Uh, so the direct conversion of sunlight into electricity is through photovoltaics, through the photovoltaic effect. And over the fast, past 50 years, PV has seen marked increases in efficiency, with the highest being up to 46%. But these are incredibly expensive uh, devices. They use triple in uh, solar cells and solar concentrators. So great for things like satellites, uh, maybe, uh, maybe not as economically feasible for things like cities. Globally, the, uh, the majority of all solar, uh, uh, solar installations globally is single-junction silicon solar cells, which can get up to around 27%. And these are incredibly stable, uh, and our, our silicon infrastructure is, is well-built. It's, it's uh, well-developed at this point. Uh, so the, this is a, a fantastic fa technology for um, converting sunlight into electri uh, electricity. Um, but currently, we use about 500 microns of electronic-grade silicon in order to build these devices. It makes them incredibly heavy, very brittle, hard to transport, and slow to produce. Uh, so these are cri uh, crystalline silicon solar cells. are also called first-generation solar cells. And because of some of these drawbacks, there has been a lot of research in second and third generation solar cells. So second generation are also thin film solar cells. They use materials like uh, copper, indium, gallium uh, selenide, or cadmium tel telluride, like uh, is used in companies like First Solar. And these have gotten a, a very strong 23% tw efficiency. And the advantage that these has is even though sometimes the material choice is a little more expensive, you can use 100 times less material and still make a solar cell of, of, of um, very effective efficiency. And this, would make them e this makes them easier to, to transport and easier to put up on scaffolding as well, since there's more costs involved than just, um, than just the panels themselves. There's also uh, the entire system. So I've done research for eight years in solar now. And the first three were in uh, uh, quantum dot solar cells. So all, all eight years have been in these third generation solar cells sort of at the research frontier of, of new materials for, um, uh, for solar energy. So the first three years were in quantum dot solar cells, and then these past five years have been in polymer solar cells. Uh, so this is in the organic solar cells. And you can see around 2002, they were still a very low efficiency as things always start out. But um, very quickly, uh, by 2014, they had already reached 10.8%. And even though this is only two and a half times, uh, this is still two and a half times less efficient than a, um, a silicon solar cell, they have many advantages that make them, uh, that make them great, uh, give them great potential 
uh, for powering, uh, powering our cities and also a number of other applications. For one, they're incredibly lightweight. So you can actually use 5,000 times less material. They only need to be about 100 nanometers thick. Uh, this makes them easy to produce, easy to transport. They have very, very fast energy payback times. They can, the, the amount of energy embodied in the processes to make them and the materials to make them can be photo converted within a, within a single year. They're customizable. You have all the versatility of organic chemistry at your disposal. And this allows you to customize things like their electronic properties or their band gap, and that allows you to pick uh, what their spectral absorption might be uh, from, from the sun. And last, they can be made ultra thin, which makes them compliant and durable. These are, uh, these are huge benefits when having to uh, transport these types of devices. But if you can make them so compliant and durable, here's a solar cell that's been wrapped around the thinness of a human hair. Uh, you can start to open up new functionalities with these types of devices, uh, besides just um, uh, uh, energy for, uh, for residential, commercial, or utility, you can actually start building them into things like textiles and opening up these types of uh, new functionalities. So some, just a few other benefits of uh, third generation solar cells and, and uh, as well as OPVs. So 10% efficiency is what they're at now. Would something like that be enough to make a difference? Here's a map of the United States. And inside, you'll see superimposed a red square. And this calculation was done by uh, Nate Lewis uh, from Caltech for his Protecting the Planet uh, talk and MRS bulletin, or sorry, Powering the Planet, MRS talk and bulletin. So if you could fill this red square with solar cells of just 10% efficiency, you would be able to meet the nation's energy demands uh, for the foreseeable future. It's a 3.3 terawatt, terawatt square. The problem is this, uh, filling this with solar cells would be by no means an easy task. It's about 1.7 percent the land mass of the United States. Um, so this would be quite a technological undertaking. But we've, uh, our, our, our society has taken on a, a, a task like of this size uh, before. If you integrate the square area of the nation's number of highway systems, you get an area that's roughly similar, similar to this. So we've done something like this before. We've done it with concrete. If we could do it with ultralight solar cells, uh, it might even be easier than, than concrete. So could you produce them fast enough? Um, so OPVs, uh, organic solar cells, perovskite solar cells, these types of things can all be printed as well. So we collaborated with a group, um, Frederick Krebs's group in DTU, and they actually print solar cells. So this is a solar cell printing press. Right? It can print them by the kilometer, much like a, a newspaper. Right? Um, and they can also deploy them in low-cost, uh, high-speed methods as so. Uh, a number of these plastic solar cells were also deployed uh, across rural Africa in, this, in a, a Lighting Africa initiative. When, they, when those devices were recollected, they found that many of them had failed, and they hadn't failed because they chemically, due to chemical degradation. They had failed because of mechanical So in order to survive the processing of being wrapped around these rolls and these reels, and then rolled up and unrolled, they, they need to accommodate a certain amount of strain from being flexed into a circle. Um, so the mechanical properties are essential uh, to the, to the uh, uh, to the effectiveness, to the, um, to the success of a, of a technology like OPV. So we worked, uh, we collaborated them on a number of their uh, mechanical properties testings, and then we also decided to see if, how far we could uh, push the mechanical optimization of these types of or, uh, organic electronic devices. So we set our sights on a goal to create what we called a solar tarp, and this would be an extremely robust uh, solar textile that could be deployed in disaster relief or remote defense applications. So um, if there is no grid, or if the grid is knocked out, say somewhere like Haiti, instead of just these uh, normal tents and tarps, you could deploy uh, this solar textile and provide protection uh, from the elements while soaking up sunlight and giving energy to life-saving equipment below. So this is the goal that we were aiming for with a lot of our applications and prototypes that we did. And before I begin on those, I want to go into some of the solar cell architecture and then some of the photophysics. So uh, here we have a schematic of an OPV. And it starts with a substrate, glass, or maybe a, a plastic substrate. Um, and then first, you, these, these are made layer by layer. You start with a transparent conductive electrode. And it has to be transparent because light needs to be able to come in and still hit the active layer. And it needs to be conductive so it can fil facilitate the proper charges, of course. And uh, on top of that, we have the active layer. So this is what does the absorbing of light and the splitting of charge. And then on top, we put a, a counter electrode, a top electrode, sorry. And if you connect the circuit here, uh, charges when split would be able to go around. And then you can measure them right with the source meter and back around. So within that bulk heterojunction, 
Um, the workhorse material of the field uh, is a composite of poly-3 alkyl thiophene, a conjugated polymer, and a PCBM, a phenyl C61 butric acid methyl ester. And inside the bulk heterojunction, these uh, two materials mix and rearrange themselves and phase separate in a bit of a complicated uh, uh, microstructure. We'll see here there's three phases, so it's a ternary phase structure. The first, uh, the there's two crystalline phases and a very disordered phase. So first crystalline phase, we'll, we'll look at the, um, the conjugated polymer, the P3AT. And because it's uh, a very flat polymer, it has these uh, thiophene rings, it will chain fold on itself. It will pie stack. And this creates these brittle uh, uh, but, but crystalline lamella structures. And uh, they're mechanically much, uh, much more brittle, but they're able to uh, facilitate the mobility of charge uh, very effectively. And then we have a second crystalline phase, and this is a pure PCBM phase. Uh, these spheres pack together very nicely. And then the third phase is this mixed phase, which has, uh, is characterized by uh, quite a bit of disorder. It's much softer, uh, but it doesn't transport charge as well. But we'll see soon that the interplay, the balance of these three phases, having some spots that are a bit softer and some parts that are harder but, but carry charge is, is uh, a way to, to optimize these devices for their mechanics and their electronics. Okay, so some of the OPV photophysics. Uh, the way in which you turn light into electricity, you create, uh, you take uh, the donor and the acceptor, right? Uh, two semiconductors and put them adjacent to each other. Light comes in and it's absorbed by a phase. Uh, let's say it's absor absorbed by the donor phase um, and it creates an exciton. So it excites an electron and this creates what's known as an exciton pair. So this is an electron and a whole pair and they are tightly bound um, and uh, essentially charge, they'll, they'll feel themselves as charge neutral because uh, they'll balance out from a distance and they'll, they'll just diffuse around in the microstructure until they either, the lifetime of the electron uh, is met and it will recombine with the hole or it'll navigate towards one of the interfaces where the two charges, the two charge carriers will be delocalized from each other. So the electron will see, um, it'll jump from the highest occupied molecular orbital into the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. It'll see the LUMO of the acceptor and here's why it's called the electron acceptor. Um, it accepts it into uh, its LUMO. So now the charges uh, are delocalized from each other and due to a uh, difference in voltage potential on the contacts, which is uh, you, you select them to have a different work function from each other, the two charges will be carried to their appropriate contacts where they can uh, travel around a circuit and perform some useful work. We characterize these solar cells. Uh, the, the main method of characterization is what we call the JV curve. So J is the current density and V is the uh, the voltage and it's this very uh, you sweep the voltage and you measure the current density as you sweep voltage through and um, it's you notice it's a bit of a rectangular shaped curve and the more rectangular like it is the better actually so the maximum power point will be where the product of the current density and the voltage are, are, are maximized are the highest a convenient metric that we use actually uh, to sort of measure the square like shape of this uh, curve is called the fill factor and you would, you would arrive at this by taking the product of the uh, max power point power, um, over the ratio of that over the uh, product of the VOC and the JSC. And then we use this oftentimes to calculate the power conversion efficiency. So take the open circuit voltage uh, multiplied by the uh, sh uh, short circuit uh, current density and then times the fill factor. But really, if you look at the fill factor, the denominator is there. So it's really just power out times power in. So power conversion efficiency, I'll just refer that to that as the efficiency from this point forward. And the last thing that we'll cover before we begin the applications is how to make electronics stretchable. So there's three effective methods of doing this. Uh, the first one is through deterministic patterning. It's by far the most complicated way, uh, but it allows us to use some of our higher performance materials and a lot of the infrastructure that we already have, um, that we already have for, high, uh, for things like metals and semiconductor processing. So a lot of times you evaporate um, patterns, like fractal patterns such as this. Uh, so um, we can see rather than th when the uh, device is stretched, rather than transferring the strain into uh, pulling the metallic bonds together, you can transfer the strain into macroscopic configurational changes. You can unwind these fractal shapes in, um, and unbend them. And then here we have, uh, this is a, a microarray of solar cells, so it can, be, it can be done with solar cells too. And this is called the island bridge method. So you have a microarray of solar cells connected by these little zigzag bridges. So when you stretch them out, the zigzag bridges also go through these configurational changes. They unbend. Um, 
and you're able to stretch the device. But it's, a, a, it's uh, difficult and complex to pattern these things, uh, uh, these things in this manner. So one, another method is called through random composites. This takes advantage of uh, easier fabrication techniques like spray coating or printing. So you can still use metals uh, for these types of things. You just have to use high aspect ratio uh, metal structures or nanostructures. So here, uh, nano, silver nanowires were spray coated on, on a stretchable sheet, an elastic sheet. And then when stretched, those nanowires can either rotate or slide past each other, but they'll still maintain this, uh, in, this uh, percolated pathway, this interconnected pathway that charges can travel through. You can stretch these things, you can elongate these things uh, by, by hundreds of percent. And here we have an SCM of carbon nanotubes. You can see how serpentine they are, and this is what allows the, uh, the so carbon nanotubes would not be stretchable, but they can go through those configurational changes. And you can, one could uh, develop stretchable, con uh, stretchable transparent, transparent conductive electrodes with these. So the last way is through molecularly stretchable materials or intrinsically stretchable uh, devices. So in this, um, in, in this method, we have the uh, strain is actually being accommodated by the, uh, by the uh, molecular structure of the functional material itself. So you actually have stretchable electronic materials. And this is, uh, this is beneficial uh, for, for devices that use conductive materials and semiconductive materials since you can maintain a contiguous film as you stretch the device. And here we can see an LED, there's a solar cell uh, up, up top, and then an LED that has been stretched to 120% strain. Okay, so with, uh, if you have these uh, conjugated polymers and they're plastic electronics, does that mean that they are automatically going to be uh, flexible and stretchable? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, a no. Actually, a number of them are very brittle, so you have to be very careful with your molecular design rules when you make them. I in work that is, uh, was shown by Dr. Sutil Savagatrap, who's here from, from MIT, um, and a lot of Sutil's work, uh, uh, a lot of the work that he had spearheaded provided the, the fundamental basis and design rules um, that I had used and incorporated in the new applications and prototypes. You'll see his name come up quite a bit through this. Um, all right, so uh, P.PSS, the stretchable uh, uh, transparent conductive electrode that we use in our solar cells, we see it here cracking at 10%. If you process it completely wrong, it can crack, crack as low as 3%. Um, and then P P3HD, PCBM, that uh, workhorse material for the solar cells, uh, cracks. Um, here, you can see the cracks easily. Oh, sorry, this should be 20. Uh, at 10% but it will actually crack uh, when annealed at only 1% strain, so it's incredibly easy to destroy your solar cells uh, if you were to use um, uh, this material. And when we started in 2012, all of the literature actually stated P3AT, PCBM, it's organic photovoltaics, it's flexible and it's stretchable. So some of our first studies actually aim to dispel this and then aim to figure out why they aren't and how to make them, uh, how to make them more mechanically compliant. So one of the first studies conducted uh, by our group and spearheaded by Sutil, as, as I mentioned, was um, the, uh, uh, just changing one molecular parameter and seeing how this affects uh, the mechanical properties of the bulk and affects the mechanical properties of thin films. So changing the uh, length of this alkyl side chain um, from 4 to 10, so that's this carbon chain sticking off the thiophene. And I'll just refer to these, if it has a carbon chain length of 6, I'll call it C6. And a carbon chain length of 8, I'll call it C8. And so on. So as you increase the length of the carbon chain, you decrease the tensile modulus. And, as you, and, and so at about uh, C8, this effect plateaus. And conversely, uh, so C4 and C6, they crack at less than, well less than 5% strain, especially in a composite, um, around 3%. And then at C8, all of a sudden, you can stretch your device up to 45% strain. Um, so we wanted to demonstrate how critical this was in uh, device fabrication. So I, I designed a, a, a biaxially stretchable um, OPV that we transfer printed on the surface of this glass hemisphere. And we tried this experiment with C6 and C8. We used finite element analysis that predicted we would need about, tw it would need, the device would need to accommodate 24% strain in order, to, um, in order to maintain uninterrupted, uh, uninterrupted function. This is our transfer printing process. We would actually build our solar cells first on a PDMS sheet on an elastomeric substrate and then uh, drive a test tube into it in a controlled fashion with a linear actuator, um, heat it, release, and this would transfer print the solar cell. And just to get uh, more quantitative, um, our previous results had shown that at 3%, you would see just a, a thin film crack 
uh, an unannealed thin film of, of C6 would crack, and at 47%, the composite of C8 would crack. So what we found was, as we see, um, these concentric cracks in the C6 composite, and uh, C8 is a contiguous film, and then we made devices out of this as well. You see this uh, catastrophic device cracking in C6, and C8 remains a, a fully intact solar cell. So measuring the electronic, uh, the um, photoconversion of these, uh, the JV curve, we see that C6 it has complete failure uh, in the form of a short circuit, uh, while C8 makes a fully functioning solar cell. Uh, but you'll notice that the current density is very low on C8, and the fill factor uh, is, is quite low, uh, is quite low as well. So uh, this isn't just noticed on the hemispheres. This is actually, if you make them on flat straight flat substrates, uh, C8 is about three times less efficient as C6. So C6 gives about 3.5% 3 efficiency, C8 is only about 1%. So it seems like even though we've gained some mechanical uh, resilience and some elasticity in our material, we've lost, um, we, we've lost electronic performance. So we wanted to, to see if this, if this trade-off, um, uh, we wanted to see if we could co-engineer both uh, both, both parameters in a single material or if these, uh, these types of effects were at odds. So in a follow-up study done um, this time uh, also with Suchel and now joined by Dr. Adam Prince, they explored the space in between C6 and C8 because that's where that huge uh, change in electronic and mechanical properties was occurring. They tried a number of different polymers that were sort of averages of these two materials, block polymers, random polymers, physical blends, and they also tried C7 right in the middle. And uh, if we plot uh, uh, efficiency and tensile modulus, C8 is, uh, is low efficiency, um, but also low stiffness, right? C6 brittle, but high efficient. And the other ones kind of seem to lie on a line in between. And then C7, lucky number seven, right, is uh, in the favorable quadrant. It's, it was high, it was, had high efficiency, like that of C6, but also stretchable and low stiffness, like C8. So if one is clever enough, you can co-engineer both of these properties into one material. And uh, this, this wasn't, uh, the, the reason for this is uh, C7 is the first material to have a glass transition temperature below room, that, uh, below room temperature, but it also had a high fraction of aggregates. So the, the high fraction of aggregates would carry charge, but since it had um, still enough amorphous domains, it was able to accommodate that strain within its molecular structure. So as my job was to, to use this knowledge to, to build something, uh, what could we build today that we wouldn't have, build, build, wouldn't have been able to build yesterday without it? Uh, so this is an image of the wearable solar cell. Um, here's a schematic. It was built on a 14 micron thick polyamide substrate. So these were uh, uh, ultra thin devices that um, on layer by layer we have P.PSS and it was, uh, we used polyethylene imine to lower the work function of the P.PSS and this allowed us to use P. as both the top and bottom electrode. And now we used P3HPT, so C7, as the active layer. And we actually went, uh, went to the effort of optimizing every layer for its electronic uh, performance and its mechanical resilience. We have, uh, so you see C7 and PCBM, um, well, uh, compared to C6, PCBM would crack at 1%. We now can uh, withstand and accommodate 4% strain. Uh, by choosing our fullerenes properly, we can get another 1%, so 5% strain out of this. Now, PDOT, if you process it incorrectly with PEI, cracks at only 3%, so this would then be the, the weakest material, and it would shatter as well. So we plasticized uh, the material and, um, and changed the solvent in which we processed the, uh, uh, the work function treatment. And this was also informed uh, uh, by, some, by the material studies of our lab. So t in, in two more studies, uh, we see... Um, the choice of fullerene is very, is, uh, affects the mechanical properties too. When fullerenes are, are made, you get a mix of C70 and C60 um, uh, Buckminster fullerenes, and uh, an intense amount of energy is used to purify them and separate them from each other. But if you do this, you don't actually get much increase in your efficiency. So here we see, even if you have pure or mixes, you get roughly the same power conversion efficiency. Um, so, but if you use a mixed phase, you actually have a much lower tensile modulus and you can stretch them a little bit further. And this is because they don't pack in, uh, they don't pack in as well since they, um, uh, with, with the differences in shapes of the uh, nanostructures. So mixed fullerenes increases stretchability. And then with, uh, sorry, with PDOT, 
Um, if you add zonial, you can plasticize the layer uh, without, uh, without negatively affecting the conductivity of the film. So zonial increases stretchability. We used all of these different materials design rules in order to judiciously choose each layer a uh, mechanically resilient solar cell that we could put on the human body. We smashed it, compressing it by 75% uh, percent, a thousand times. We used finite element analysis in order to predict the strain and the strain distribution on the surface of the device. So the devices would need to accommodate 5% strain in order to uh, function without destroying the cell. So cells using C7 after a thousand cycles still maintained 80% of their, over 80% of their initial performance. And as a comparison, C6, after just 10 cycles, the device was destroyed. We then wanted to decouple mechanical degradation from chemical degradation. Um, since these devices were out in air and unencapsulated, they would be, there would be two different types of degradation mechanisms. Um, in order to do this, we, put, we had some uncycled cells that we left on the side and we watched the degradation occur. And what we notice is after about 200 cycles, uh, these two degradation curves become more or less parallel. So it seems that within the first 200, uh, uh, it shows here that within the first 200 cycles, uh, mechanical degradation attenuates. And from this point forward, it was just chemical degradation. So even after 200 cycles, um, this evidence would support that uh, the degradation had stopped and you'd actually be able to continue cycling it without any negative effects to the performance. We then used this device to power other wearable electronic devices. We used it to power a digital watch, an LED, and then um, char start charging a portable battery. And we did it using natural sunlight. So I actually dragged the whole setup out away from the solar simulator out on the bridge here and uh, powered this, this digital watch. And the digital watch is a proxy for something like a wearable biomedical sensor, uh, like the ones perhaps being made down the hall here, which use about 100 microwatts. And this is on the same order of a power demand for uh, the digital watch here. Okay, so uh, the, our, our wearable solar cell, our solar patch, that's, uh, that's where we made it to in progress towards the solar tarp so far. Um, it, it's, it used a, a huge body of um, molecular design uh, knowledge that had been gained over the uh, three and a half years before it in order to enable its uh, fabrication. And from here, we switched, gears, we switched gears to human machine interfaces and human robotic interfaces. So we also switch material types. This is a, a random composite, the, the second type that was talked about in stretchability, or in uh, methods of making uh, materials uh, devices stretchable. So this is um, uh, the smart glove, the uh, wireless gesture recognition glove that can translate American Sign Language into text, and a number of other applications of human machine interfaces um, that uh, uh, coming up soon would be uh, in 2000, uh, so robotic assisted surgery and telesurgery in 2001, the first transatlantic surgery was performed where a surgeon in the States uh, removed the gallbladder of a patient in Paris, France uh, from across the world. And you can see that he's using these little pens in order to control uh, the robotic interface. Uh, but a surgeon's best tools are his hands, so um, more advanced human machine interfaces would be, able to, would be a huge benefit in, in uh, applications, in medical applications like this. It's also being used in defense training. Um, it's being used in hazardous job training. So that soldiers and uh, people who are working on things like gas leaks can practice in uh, safety of a virtual environment. And, but you can see also here they're using these little, uh, it's hard to see, but they're using stick-like controllers. So they don't get muscle memory and it's not, um, it's certainly, um, uh, there's still an interface that is need to be de needs to be developed. And also an art and expression. So this is artist Emojin Heap. Um, and she's actually uh, has uh, these gesture recognition gloves, a different, a different type um, that do, uh, sorry, they allow her to control sound using her hands and gestures. So we chose, uh, for our, our sensors, we chose these low-cost sensors for accessibility and biomedical application, so uh, sign language translation. Um, the glove consists of two parts. There's the sensor field and then the, uh, uh, sorry, the sensor array and then the wearable computation. And the computation has uh, three components within it. There's an accelerometer, a Bluetooth, and a microcontroller unit. And this is all attached to a custom-made PCB and on the PCB, there are a printed circuit board. And uh, built into the printed circuit board are nine voltage divider circuits. And each sensor is a variable resistor and serves as a variable resistor for in the voltage divider circuit. The flow of information goes as follows. Um, the user will make, make a hand gesture uh, with the sensor glove on, where the signal at this point will be a resistance. 
so the resistance increases. As the resistance increases across um, uh, R2, uh, the, uh, the voltage drop across V out will also increase. So the, um, the microcontroller unit measures the increase in voltage. So it goes from resistance to voltage, and it watches all nine sensors at the same time. If that voltage value goes higher than a threshold value, it will assign a 1 to, that, to the state of that sensor. If it stays below a value, it will assign a 0 to it. So it watches all nine sensors, and it generates a binary key, a nine-digit binary key. Each letter, uh, each hand signal, will have its own key uh, associated with it. So it'll read those keys uh, through this uh, letter dis um, uh, through, through an algorithm that decides which letter is appropriate to send to the cell phone, and then it'll send that, that character uh, to the screen of a cell phone via Bluetooth. Okay, so these are what our sensors look like. They're about three centimeters long and about 500 microns thick. Um, PDMS uh, substrate with this, uh, uh, with a, a piezo, uh, with, uh, sorry, with an electronic ink painted on them. It's a, a piezo resistive film, makes a piezo resistive film. It's actually uh, made out of um, uh, com this commercially ab available um, electronic paint that is used to ground samples in electron microscopes. And then polyurethane is, is used to encapsulate it with copper tape and uh, a conductive thread to, make, to establish electrical contact. And here are some SEM images of the cross section. We have about 300 microns of PDMS, 50 microns of DAG, and uh, encapsulated in polyurethane. If we look at the microstructure, we can see uh, how, it's, um, how it's formed here. We have a fluorolastomer matrix, and embedded within it are these nano-sized carbon particles. We'll take a, a zoom in closer. You can see these things, uh, these um, gra graphite particles and carbon black particles are on the order of um, sub-100 nanometers. And as they stretch, the interparticle distance will increase, the, resist the resistivity and resistance will go up across the sensor. So we wanted to characterize our sensors then. Uh, we put the sensors on the back of the glove. And here, in this one in particular, is on the back of the, uh, the middle metacarpal knuckle. And when we formed a fist, the resistance would increase. And then when we relax the hand, the resistance would decrease. So we did a few cycles of, of um, forming a fist and relaxing the hand. We can see it goes from about 600 ohms to about 1.2 kilo ohms. And then in order to estimate the strain that was being applied to the sensors, we put these sensors on a linear actuator and uh, did a controlled stretch of these. And we saw how the resist, and we um, matched the resistance increase, right? We approximated the resistance increase. And we got about 4.4% strain, but this is in a linear strain mode. And when you put the sensor on the back of a knuckle and, fle and flex your hand, the strain will not be evenly distributed as it would if you grabbed it by both sides and, and, and pulled it uh, linearly. So what we have is this um, um, uneven strain distribution. And we used finite ele element analysis, and once again, to model the strain distribution. And then we have to know whether the strain is, a, is a linearly dependent, or sorry, the resistance change is linearly dependent on strain or nonlinear. So we do resistance versus strain, and we see this nonlinear dependence. Uh, it's a, a sharp increase at low strains, and about, at about 1% or a little over 1% strain, it seems to, to level out. So there's almost two strain regimes here. So we integrate the, um, uh, the resistance versus strain curve with the finite element analysis model and we get about 5.5% peak strain. Uh, we then took some of these sensors and stretched them 1,000 times at 5.5% strain to, do our, uh, to see the resilience of these sensors over many, many cycles. And uh, what we find is after 1,000 cycles, so this is a log plot, um, uh, so the signal does change after many hundreds of cycles. The, the, high, bound seems, uh, the high bound increases, but its ability to uh, detect um, whether the knuckle would be bent or, or relaxed, uh, whether the fingers were articulated or not, would still be preserved. Actually, the, the sensors would just become more sensitive. And since in this application in particular, we're just looking for um, uh, the change of state from low to high, it was, the glove was able to continuous, uh, uh, continuously detect the, the correct letter months after we built it. So I had initially thought the prototype would only last for maybe a few days or a week or so, but four months later, it was still uh, uh, it was still translating the correct letters, and I was able to bring it um, all, all over to, to CWS and to many, many other places. So I was really, uh, really happy with that, it turned out. Here is, uh, we called this one, uh, this, the, the Rosetta Stone. Uh, so this is the raw data of, the, of each sensor uh, being, wa uh, being mapped, or being observed and measured uh, simultaneously. So this is going through all the gestures of the alphabet in a row, the, the sort of the, the unbreak, unbroken 
um, stream of data. And to kind of get an idea how this detects the proper letter, we'll use A as an example. So A has all, um, all of the fingers flexed except for the thumb, which will remain straight. So the thumb, because the sensor is not bent, will be zero, the rest one. And it may be a bit hard to see in the back, but there are dotted lines that run across each trace. If the, red, if the voltage uh, signal is below that of the red line, it will assign a zero. If it's above that, uh, uh, above the dotted line, it will be given a one. So A should, have, should be below the dotted line here, as it is, and then all the rest are above it. And now, conveniently, B is the exact opposite key. And we see the, uh, so, um, so what we see is the trace has now jumped up. It's now uh, above the threshold value. So it's now assigned to one, and the rest, all the signals have dropped down, so below. So as each uh, finger was relaxed, the resistance across the sensor dropped. And this is, uh, so this is the, the way in which we generated the key and uh, decided what letter we were going, uh, what letter was being made by the user. Some letters have degenerate keys, though. I and J have the same hand configuration. They just require motion. So uh, in order to decouple these degenerate keys, uh, we would use either pressure sensors or, or, or an accelerometer. So let's take I and J, for example. Notice they have the same key generated. And the accelerometer value of the threshold here was a, a, if a value of higher than 3,000. Um, of course, we can, you can code in whichever threshold value you, you need for these things, depending on, um, uh, uh, depending, depending on what the needs of the application are. So above 3,000, um, the absolute value of 3,000 uh, gives, gives you J, whereas below will give you I. Okay, so this is, one of the way, this is the way in which we would uh, decouple degenerate letters that require motion. All right, so here's a demonstration of, of the glove. Um, spelling out UCSD, it'll go real uh, slow, so I can rotate my hand and everyone can see, so this is U. Right? And we, so not only did we uh, use this to send text wirelessly to the screen of a cell phone, but we also took the serial output um, from this device, stored it, and then uh, Sam Root coded up a, a virtual hand, and we were able to send signals to a virtual hand and then have, that, have the virtual hand mimic uh, the shapes of the letters. So you can see how these, uh, this type of application is, um, would be useful for um, uh, human-machine interfaces with virtual and augmented realities, especially since the, the entire cost of the prototype was under $100. The sensors are incredibly inexpensive, and as are many of the electronic components. OK, so for a final, uh, for a final project that I took on, I actually uh, led a team of um, senior design engineers uh, and I want to give special thanks to Colin Keefe, who uh, really uh, uh, put in ma massive amounts of effort on this project. And now, actually, he's going to be doing uh, his master's um, in, in our laboratory and carrying this project forward. So it's really exciting that uh, this project will keep moving. So uh, we're using the same sensors uh, d designed and then and led a team to build a touch emulation glove that was able to uh, control a 3D printed robot hand uh, with its hand gestures and uh, even more the robot hand had a number of sensors on its fingertips, and those sensors would take in pressure, so tactile information and temperature information, and then would send it to actuators on the palmer side of the glove and allow the user to feel pressure and temperature uh, that the robot would be feeling from a distance. And um, this uh, is also easy to open up a serial port and then feel perhaps like a, a virtual stimuli, like a virtual fire or something. So the way this goes is actually the exact opposite of the language of glove which was turning human signals or human gestures into machine signals. Now we're turning machine signals back into human uh, sensation. So we have the robot hand and uh, the sensors on it. So uh, the sensors send the signal to the uh, micro microcontroller. The microcontroller then sends the signals to the actuators, which are on the palm of the glove. And this gives the, uh, the user sensation on their, their fingertips. So a little bit of what this would look like. The same piezoresistive sensors that we talked about before put on one of the five knuckles this time, and uh, connected by a, a Bluetooth uplink here, and they control servo, servos and cables. And those servos and cables draw the fingers um, and, and control the articulation of the hand. And next on the, the palmer surface, so the, the, the feeling side of the glove, right, we have haptic touch motors, and those are Bluetooth uh, connected through the, through the microcontrollers to pressure sensors. So the pressure sensors take in a stimuli and send an appropriate um, uh, uh, an appropriate response to the haptic touch motors. So this actually had resolution too. If you grabbed the um, pressure sensors lightly, gently, 
you would feel a light buzz. If you, if you grab them hard, you'd feel a much stronger buzz. And then last, uh, temperature sensors were hand just below. And then uh, thermo, uh, thermoelectric units were embedded in uh, the, the palm of the glove um, to give uh, hot and cold. So here we have a video of OK, well, this won't work, but we got all the others. OK, so I'll find the video for this in a second. Um, yeah, so here we have the video. It uh, would have been the video of me controlling the robot hand. And it basically, it's, it's as one would expect. Um, moving the fingers, the robot hand moves along with it. All right, so in summary, um, so we, we covered a, a lot of ground. We've come a long way from just uh, stretching films and transfer printing them onto the top surface of glass hemispheres. Um, but this was an incredibly important study to show that how important it was to pick your materials properly before you begin uh, engineering your application or your prototype. Uh, so we showed uh, the, that not all um, organic electronics are flexible and stretchable. And then um, using, uh, using the molecular design rules, co-engineered, uh, uh, built, built a device that co-engineered both mechanical performance uh, and, and uh, effective uh, photo, con uh, photo conversion into a wearable solar cell to power other wearable electronic devices. Um, then uh, use composite materials in order to design a, a smart glove for gesture recognition um, and American Sign Language translation and finished with a fully integrated haptic control of robots and the transmission of touch from uh, remote and virtual environments. Okay, so we'll end with uh, a list of publications that I've, I've um, published throughout the years. The first seven are from my work in my master's. Uh, the other 11 come from my work here. There were two textbook chapters. Um, a few of these came in backwards. That's really cool. <laughs> All right, yeah, as Darren had mentioned, there was, the, there was some, um, some competitions won. The, uh, you know, he already mentioned these, and then a lot of media came, the ABC 10, KPBS. It was really exciting. It was really cool. I was, I was really honored to that, that, that there was so much interest in these projects, and I was really honored to be able to, to work on our Applied Frontier. I want to give a huge thank you uh, to everyone for coming today. Um, thank you to the committee. Thank you so much, Darren, for everything that you've taught me over the years, uh, for, all, um, for, for all the guidance and uh, for allowing me to, to work on these amazing projects. A huge thanks to Dr. Sutro Savagatra. Uh, it was, we, we had a great synergy working together. Uh, it was a good symbiosis, doing fundamentals and applications together. Uh, thank you to Dr. Adam Prince and Alex Zaretsky and Brandon Marin. Uh, we had a wonderful lab. Thanks, Sam Root. Um, I also want to give a special thanks to Rachel Miller, uh, my undergraduate apprentice, who helped me with the uh, language of glove and transmission of touch projects. Uh, couldn't have done it without you. Thank you. And um, uh, my other apprentice, Ivana Diaz, who helped with the solar projects, as well as thanks to funding agencies, ARCs, and NDSCG, and NIH. So I'll be happy to take your questions.